really looking forward to today's podcast. We've got cameraman Dave. He is an instructor, a film instructor at Niagara College currently. Uh, but he produced and filmed and was really the jack of all trades on the Dream Car Garage shows and the Legendary Motor Car shows. He's got so many good stories. He's an articulate guy. He's a well-read guy and just a pleasure to sit down and chat with. So if you guys enjoy the podcast, please rate it, subscribe, and share it with some friends. Enjoy. When I started working for Pete, if you want to broadcast camera, 70 grand. Yeah. Right? It's crazy. And now it looks like a Fisher Price quality. Yeah. Yep. Now that you look at an iPhone, whatever, 13X Pro, it's your phone. Yep. I think in the last three years, I've had two students leave the college. And they both went out and bought Black Magics. Like, and what are, what are those? Uh, it's one of those sort of, for my money, it's the best midpoint between the multi-chip TV cameras that we've always used. Okay. And then, you know, you get the... These heavyweight Reds and Alexas, uh, not Alexas, um, Venices, these film, you know, super high-end image makers, but Black Magic's like right in the middle. And it's and what, just, like 30 grand a, or something? It's a single chip. Oh, much less than that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, the cost is always the glass, of course. Sure. But like the quality of the image these kids are producing, they're straight out of college. I'm like, we never did that. Yeah. Oh, no, no, <laughs> no. But that's good for them. Yeah. Well, look at this setup, right? Yeah, and this same is thing. A good cost DS- nothing. Yeah, a good DSLR now is making broadcast pictures yep. all day long. Yeah, beautiful. No, that's anyways, good. Do you go for turkeys this year? I did not. No. no. To be honest, I'm. I've been so busy. It's like my brother's kids are like at, uh, you know, dirt bike age. So it's mm. like I'm going to buy a trailer. That's Saturday. way better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's way <laughs> so, better. And I just I get busy. Yeah. Right. And it's between coaching and work and that stuff. One well, like three thirty a.m. is just kill yeah. you. Yeah. I do miss it. Yeah. Like I do. That's one of the few things I miss shooting, but you know, yeah, yeah. it's still, it's still, uh, I, I just got too much going on. Yeah. I always get one week of turkey season right before the first NASCAR race. And I have to, but I have to shut it down or like I can't keep chasing them up on it because I'll be just right. sleep deprived <laughs> going into the first race, but it's always a chase. And I saw you get punted Sunday. <sighs> yeah, that, that was what, two days ago. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Optimistic at best, the first move. <laughs> Oh, I know. Like I, I don't know. I was quicker than him. Got by him clean, and I sacrificed a little into the last two corners at most boards. Corner nine, no one's ever made a pass there one time ever. So I sacrificed that, and he got into me there, and it just never lifted. Oh. Never got off the bumper. And it's just yeah. It's just a smash up derby. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what I was saying to Pete. That last, those last couple corners always create. You know, every year it seems like something happens. It's well, it's such a break. Like, you can just hit, not hit the brakes and catch a guy because you have to brake so hard for corner nine. Right. So hard for corner 10. Right. That if you're the guy, you just hold it down for a second longer and you get to the bumper. That's good for TV. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's not go that far because that finish of the Formula One season last year felt like it was good for TV. It really did, eh? Yeah. I know. Yeah. I know. But what do you do? Like... Do you actually end a, a championship race under yellow? Yeah, I don't know, but uh, I just, you know, I went and tried to read up a bunch about the rules after that, but what do you do? Right, where NASCAR, NASCAR fixes it because it's just a dictatorship. <laughs> it's whatever happens, happens. We tell you how it's going to happen, and there, there's no, right. there's no, you don't appeal to the, you know, the stewards. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, I don't know. It was, I, I just, I just felt... And not that I even cared who won. Yeah. I wanted to see Lewis break the record, but by the same token, you know, it'd be cool to see two guys have two championships in two years and create more of a long-term thing. But something just felt wrong at the end of that. I don't know why. Uh, no, I agree. I agree. But I think, I think I said it on one of the other podcasts. I think all racing should adopt a green-white checkered. Mm. At all costs, you don't finish a race under yellow. Right. All right, all right, three attempts. Right. You get three attempts to actually finish the race racing. Yeah, because I don't think those guys are that close on fuel at the end. They no. can squeeze another two or three if they had to. Right, and it doesn't matter. If it's part of the rule book, you have to account for it now. Right. Yeah, that's true too. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Could be an idea. Yeah. So how'd the, uh, yeah. how'd the, how'd the school year go? How, th- what year is this for you teaching? September will be my third full-time year. So, um, yeah, no, it's good. You know, like as a... 
non-parent with no kids, sure, maybe I have a slightly lower threshold for tolerance for getting it. angry. <laughs> <laughs> but by the same token, uh, one of the things about our course that I really like is they tell us, let's give them industry standard out of the gate. Yep. So, you know, first term, you're first time away from home, so you're a little bit easy. But after that, they want you to treat them like it's a, it's a work environment, right? Yeah. So the language can get salty and the demands can get high, but part of that is also, you know, the kids who deserve it should get a better chance. Yeah. Right? So, um, no, it's great. I mean, I do love it, but I do come home with frustrations. I mean, I'm sure you guys are in the same boat dealing with trying to find good labor, mm -hmm. right? Like I... I judge my kids. I look at them and I go, you know what? I hire that kid. Right. Which is good criteria. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Um, well, funny side story. I was working the Raptors game six playoff game when Philly put him out there a few weeks ago and ran into nine of my grads on the shoot. All super cool. Really? Yeah. Kids working different jobs and on different trucks and for different networks. I was like, oh, geez, I'm getting old. So is your program pretty uh, wide where they're not, they're obviously not just going to be a camera operator? Oh, God. Yeah. 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 The, the, the program, the way it lays out is is you come in in first year mm -hmm. and you do, and I've been arguing we should maybe change these terms down the road, radio, TV, and film. Okay. Most people under 25, radio and TV. Yeah, those are appliances my parents have, yeah. like a microwave <laughs> or a fridge, right? It doesn't really, but it's more about a style of production, mm. right? So we have radio, TV, and film that you do for the, a whole term one. Then at Christmas, if you want to be presentation, so in front of a camera, behind a microphone, if you want to make a living with your persona, or your voice, you stream off into a presentation course and okay. they start working on writing skill, how you look and sound, et cetera. The rest of the kids in term two stay in production, film and TV. At the end of term two, then you pick TV or film and then your last two years you do whatever your specialty is. But it's certainly not just about cameras. There's, you know, all kinds of production, like... You know, even in first year, we have kids doing acting as a producer, as traffic, as, a, you know, a switcher, like, you know, the machine with all the buttons, mm -hmm. uh, graphics, audio, camera, lighting. Like, we try to give them a little bit of everything. Um, and that's the hard part is you can't possibly prepare them for the real world. No. So, no. But took, at least they, they get a taste. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I look at my job now as, uh, as a college teacher as less teaching something i mean i'm teaching them about cameras and how to shoot better but these this generation is pretty good with menus and drop downs and screens and laptops and blah 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 um so that's that's the easier part relative to the i've got we've got three years to adjust attitudes right, right? so it's like you know occasionally we'll shoot the college's basketball or volleyball or soccer games and you tell them sometimes hey guys you know tomorrow's gonna be a you know an 11 10 11 12 hour day why so long oh Big production outfits, if you're working in Toronto for Dome or NHL or NBA or whatever you're doing all over the world, you generally get paid for a minimum 11-hour day. Sure. That's where it starts. Yeah. Right? So don't give me this, oh, that's such a long day nonsense. That's what it is. That's, right? that's the industry. That's every, yeah. every day. You work until it's done. Yeah. Not to mention the fact that even if you're on a regular work day somewhere, you should be the last guy to leave because if you want to impress that producer or director or client, mm -hmm. stay longer. Yeah. Get there early. Right. Yeah. Like, so that's what it's occurred to me fairly quickly is that it's more about attitude adjustment than it is about teaching any specific thing. Right. Right. No. So I, I went to, uh, I went to rate my uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> and you're, and you're on there and I actually, I've copied one down. So I've, I've picked the, the best and the worst review, <laughs> uh -oh. but I'll, I'll read them to you. The best review is the first week I had him, I knew he was going to be one of my favorite teachers. He genuinely cares about your success and gives you a taste of what the real world will be like outside of school. Uh, he has my exact sense of humor uh -oh. and is overall an awesome person to be around. But the worst one isn't much different. The worst one is, Lestraco is the most brutally honest instructor out there. He treats you like an adult and doesn't sugarcoat life or the industry. He may be a little rough in the way he presents himself, but he knows the industry and is passionate about what he does. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> They're almost the same. That's cool. Yeah. No, because I mean, I, I, I read, readily acknowledge, like I come out of the gate like a bit of a dick for the first two weeks. I want them a little bit scared. On I want purpose. Them to, yeah, yeah. I want them to know it's not high school. And I tell them, like, I don't give a shit about you guys. You don't come to class, don't apologize because I don't care. Yep. And I don't. You right. don't want to be there, don't be there. The flip side is the ones who put in the time and the effort, you guys are going to get more help from us as a staff 
than you ever thought you'd get from a teacher, right? Mm -hmm. And then I like to warn them too that if, if, and don't get me wrong, I have friends who teach, many friends who teach in high school, and I have sympathy for them. Sure. Right? Their job is not as easy as people think it is, and I think the province is not doing the kids any good by dropping standards and blah, blah. I think it was a mistake to get rid of grade 13. Mm -hmm. I don't like having 17-year-olds in my college classroom. They, you know, not that there's anything wrong with 17-year-olds, but how much, I would rather have a kid that comes out and has a, comes to our course and has a year of full-time work under their belt. Sure. Because that will change an attitude. Um so, you know, I, I, I tell them all the time that we're going to lean on you. Mm -hmm. If I lean on you and I get demanding and I get snotty and maybe loud and the language gets salty, it's because we see something in you. Yeah. Like there's lots of kids. I've, I had a girl last year. I had her in all of first year, hardly said a word to her. Great, smart kid, hard worker, all the rest of it. In cinematography classes here, she got better and better shooting, better and better editing. I'm like, yeah, this girl's got something. Then we start the mobile part of the course, which is covering sporting events so it's okay. a multi-camera go in build the thing up we have robo cams we have the whole thing and you know part way early in the term i sort of said one day you know the men's basketball game you know we're not talking ncaa speed but these fellas can still play it's pretty quick so i said who wants to do to the men's because we had to do a volleyball friday night women's and men's uh, basketball saturday women's and men's so who wants a men's basketball game nobody put their hand up because they're a little nervous it's fast okay and you know you have trouble turning the replays around quickly because mm. of the speed of the game you know, somebody gets a bucket, it goes, oh, boom, inbounds right away. And so I pointed at her, and I don't want to use her name, but I pointed at her, I said, you're directing the game. No, I don't want to. I was like, you're doing it. Yep. And she's like, no, I'm not. I'm like, you're not listening. You're doing it, right? And she was scared, and she said to me, I'm nervous. And I said, just make your mistakes. You're in college. Yeah. Right? I get pissy with laziness. I don't get pissy with mistakes. Sure. So, of course, she goes in there and just smokes it. She does such a good job. I'm talking to her afterwards, and I was like, yeah, that was fabulous. I said, so what do you want to do here? You're getting close to the end of second. You're, well, I don't want to know. Well, what are you interested in? And she kind of hummed and hawed, and I said, well, you know, what appeals to you? What did you like in high school? I don't want to say it because it's nerdy. I don't care. Yeah. She goes, well, I competed twice in the International Robotics Championships. Well, that's, that's cool as shit. That's cool as hell, and it's like... Go to a Raptors, Leafs, Argos, TFC game. There's robo cams all over the place now. Right. Right? You can have one guy run three cameras yep. if you want to. And it's like, you know, and I said to her, you got to tell us this stuff. You know, you got West Cam or whatever they're called now up here in Burlington. This is a real thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but there's this weird thing with some of the younger ones now where the, the, they don't even want to challenge themselves. And a lot of times you push and push and push a kid. <laughs> You'll succeed or you won't. If you don't, no big deal. You're just in college. Try it again. Right. Right. But she is, I think that young lady's just head and shoulders above the rest. Just just a super sharp, super hardworking, you know, you you can't give her a job that she won't just do amazingly well at. Right. 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 And that's the thing. But you got to tell us or give us a sense early what you might want to do. We'll do our best to help you when you get out there. Right? Yeah. What are some of the... Um like super notable students you've had, like as far as what they've gone on to do? In terms of what I think is a cool job or in terms of what the public might know? I have either. Well, one of our grads, um, oh, her name escapes you right now, but she is now the Toronto Raptors sideline reporter. Okay. Tall, blonde woman. Uh, she played NCAA D1 down in Miami or something, came to, back to Welland, went to Niagara College, did real well, bounced around trying to find her thing, and then she got hired last year. Ah. So I woke up one morning, and you know, there's one of our girls on TSN on yeah. the highlight pack. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. But you know, that's in front of the camera. I don't teach in that, in that space at all. Some other people do. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, we've got a young woman who graduated several years ago. She's now, um, um, there's a replay system and that sort of thing called EVS. So she does replay for the Raptors. Okay. Uh, we've got, um, uh, oh, and I think she was in either China or Japan for the Olympics this year. We mm. got one young guy, Austin, he's left and what would he be out of school? Eight or 10 years now? He's been to like three Olympics. Like, it, it, you know, and these guys, it's it's not that they're particularly, you know, it's not like in school you go, oh, you can tell that kid's career is going to be something he or she has never dreamt of, mm -hmm. but all you can see is the killer work ethic. Sure. Right? So once you sort of release them into the world, off they go, and then they'll prove for themselves, right? Like uh, the the Austin kid, I have him come in and talk to my students whenever I can because he's an excellent example. Mm -hmm. And he went to, you know, the big dome productions. So at one point he was sent up to take the cabling 
away from a field that had been hanging there for months when the Tiger Cats played at University of Guelph Stadium okay. instead of Tim Hortons Field. Yeah. So somebody had to go get all that cable when the Tiger Cats moved back to Hamilton and bring it back to the warehouse. And if I recall, they dumped all this cable on the floor. They're like, new guy, wash all that cable. At thousands of feet, right? Yeah. So he's there with a bucket and soap and, you know, <laughs> one foot at a time. I was like, is that like your worst day ever? He's like, I came this close to quitting. Yeah. You know, but young people don't get sometimes. That's what we do. Yeah. We push the new guys and see if they're going to collapse well, and exactly. be a big baby and leave. And then cut to that would have been probably spring of his early summer of his graduating year. Eight months later, he's in Sochi, Russia. Yep. You know, he's like a 22, 23 year old kid. He's in Russia for three months working the Olympics. Yeah. All because of the work ethic, right? Mm. Like, so those are the you know. There's a kid, Will, who's engineer and training on a truck. Uh, um, Kristen, same thing. This tall blonde girl who I just love to death. A little bit nerdy, but you know, here's this young lady. Here's a fifty million dollar TV truck, and she flies around North America working X Games or working this. And you know, when NBC books the truck and they come and say that truck has to do this, yep. she makes it happen. Wow. There are no excuses there, right? So it's like we've got some of these high achievers, and they just go. Man, I didn't see him going there, but yep. good for them, yep. right? Now, you're because you've only been a professor uh, for the last three years, uh, and it's not like an Ivy League school. But is there when you when you hear professor or teacher or whatever, you immediately think of the culture being this left wing ideologues. Is that the case at your college? Uh. I mean, I, I never call myself professor. Right. I go by instructor. Okay. Right. This is not U of T or Waterloo or Harvard or something. Sure. You know, it's it's like a small college, but we also do something different than university. Right. Right. Um, is there a bunch of that that, you know, I see and maybe disagree with up close? Yeah. Okay. But you don't see it that much amongst the kids. That was my next question. Yeah. Like I heard some stuff this year in first year that shocked me. You know, okay. where kids were sort of saying, I don't understand this movement or I don't understand that movement. And it was not what it was four or five years ago because I, I was part time a day or two a week. Right. right. And uh, I don't know. It's it, some of what maybe some people would say is that hyper left wing. Everybody's exactly equal. There's no difference in the genders. Blah. blah. I hear kids sort of snapping back against that now. Mm. Right. Which was. And not then you're saying that wasn't the case four or five years ago. Well, I, I think it goes in waves, right? Like, yep. like, and I like kicking off these discussions with the kids mm -hmm. um, because again, depending on which in this day and age, which media you follow and which social media follow, I think there's a bunch of complete nonsense out there. It doesn't oh, yeah. mean I disagree with the overall goals of, of a movement, but the specifics sometimes I take, sure. I have an argument with, right? So do you have, or did you have maybe more four years ago, these kind of like fundamental disagreements with some students where you guys can't even agree on what the goal is? I don't think it's ever been that bad. Yeah. Um, you know, because, and again, in general, I think most of the kids we see are fairly respectful and, and mm -hmm. you know, you get the odd serious meathead, almost never lasts. Yeah. But, um, you know, uh, uh, again, like, some of my most rewarding experiences at the college are not necessarily about teaching. They're about something else. Mm. So I had an incident last year where we had this transgender kid sitting up in our studio and there were three or four other students and they're preparing for a production we were doing. And they started talking about something that had been said in the news about the, the trans movement. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Ooh, geez, I got this trans kid sitting over there behind a computer yeah. checking her script. And these other four people, I'm like, if this goes off the rails, I gotta be a little bit careful here. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm sort of listening and hoping it doesn't get ugly and that I have to sort of jump in the middle. But the trans kid stood up at one point and said, just so you guys know, like I was born a male and, and I've been living a female for X number of years. And, blah, blah. and the other three sort of turned around and agree or disagree. I don't know, but respectful of the conversation. Yeah. yeah. yeah and yeah. so at that point, I'm like, guys, that was that was pretty cool. Right. right. You don't have to agree, but you should at least acknowledge. Yeah. yeah you yeah. know, so, yeah, those things, they can get dicey, you get a little bit. Yeah. I'm a little bit nervous because I'm like, I don't want to get myself or any of them into trouble. But um, that particular example I thought was pretty Yeah, no, pretty that's cool. good. Just because right. I know, like, I've known you probably, whatever, since I was eight years old or yeah. whatever. And I, you're a guy who doesn't have a filter in my mind. Yeah. 
have you had to reel that in a little bit? Oh, 100%. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Of course, in the classroom. Sure. Right. So a good amount then. Yeah. And just by your own doing. Yeah. And that has less to do with, you know, what the college says or believes than, um, you know, I want to be right down the middle. Sure. Because I don't know what these kids think and believe. Right. Um, you know, put it this way, forget the stuff about, uh, you know, right or left or whatever, you know, um, sometimes you hear people say, you know, oh, that was ghetto or welfare. Well, what if you got some really financially challenged kids in the class sure. who come from a single family background and all the rest of it? Like, I don't want that kid to feel left out. They're here and they're going to try, mm -hmm. but you never know what could make a kid or somebody feel like a little bit of an outsider, which isn't to say I care about their feelings all the time because sometimes I don't. Mm -hmm. I judge that on what happens in the classroom, right? Right. Like I laid into a student towards the end of the term this year about something that should have been done much better. That particular student started tearing up. And I'm like, don't give me the tears bullshit. I don't care. You had a week to prepare. You didn't do it. And then the next day, one of their friends came in and said, oh, you know, so-and-so cried all night. I don't care. Mm -hmm. You had a week to do the most basic thing and you didn't do it. Yeah. That makes you a dick, right? So, you know, it's, it's less about offense than it is about I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I don't know who these, I usually get 60 or 80 of them every f first term in September. So I don't know their situations. Right. So I, I dial it back a little bit. But if you ask most of my students by week eight or 10, the jokes start to get harsh. And, sure. You know, like <laughs> yeah. We give out some pretty, uh, some pretty heavy nicknames. And again, that's a reflection. Our course is quite, you know, we're all on a first name basis. There's no mister. There's mm -hmm. no, you know, and we spend so much time together. The hour load sort of ensures that you are comfortable with one another. Right. We spend a lot of time in the TV truck or in the classroom or shooting these extra events um, that you've, you know, you may not even like that person you're working with, yep. but you better. Well, that's one of the stayings I tell them all the time is like the world is full of assholes. Get used to dealing with them. It's a life skill. Yeah. You can't go out in the world and say, this guy's making me uncomfortable. I'm not doing it. Well, you might have to work with him for five years. <laughs> that's right. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. look at the guy who started the show that Pete took over. Right. Yeah. And, bit of a character yeah not easy to work with but ultimately we got shows done right got to do it is right? that so how did that how did that whole thing come about because i was probably like seven or eight when he started doing the dream car garage show or whatever it was before then were you what was the show called if i recall correctly because this is a long time ago the show was called classic car restoration right. the original producer had had um Tom, who ended up obviously working with us and Pete for a long time, and a guy, Dan, is the host. The producer was, he was a bit of a handful, a bit of a different sort of dude, but sets, beautiful, always had, uh, seemed to have lots of sponsors, and the show ticked along for a few years. And, and you were a camera operator on it. I was working for a small studio that was contracted to do all the production work and editing, okay. yeah. Um, and then when things sort of turned upside down and that show crashed and Pete bought it or took it back or however it worked because the guy owed a ton of money apparently okay um apparently the old original producer owed money to the hosts and to our post house the house that i worked for the production house and um when pete took the show over he just called me and said hey um you know do you want to come work for me and i th and if i recall correctly he said to our post house listen i'm not paying you money somebody else owes you but if you guys want to start clean, I will bring all my work to you for the foreseeable future right as long as i'm doing tv i'm with you guys okay the studio's like deal and then we went, you know, 20 years together. So a good decision, I think, by everybody in the end, right? Yeah. And so I left that place to go uh, um, to freelance. So I ended up doing, you know, the show for you guys and for Pete and Tom for many years. But it was, uh, it was a pretty quick transition. <laughs> like, it all happened in a bit of a hurry. Right. Right. So, yeah, straight to freelance. And then I'm sure the first year it was Tom and my dad. Yep. And I'm sure he, <laughs> he looked at the financials and went, oh, we need, we need like half these guys. Yeah. Yeah. And he cut a bunch of well, that. Well, we never had what would be called a a proper sort of professional sized TV production crew. We were never six guys, never mind 15, right? Right. So I think initially it was, I don't remember who my audio person was back then, but we had a, you know, <laughs> you know, legendary motor car and dream car garage and sports car evolution. They were never done in quotes the right way. Yeah. When I would tell my Toronto friends about what we were doing, they're like, that's ridiculous. You can't produce a show with only two people. Well, that's funny. We were in the air 21 years. How are you doing? Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> like, yeah. but that's one of the things that, that, you know, we, we sort of, I, I don't know, it sort of evolved that Pete it, and Tom were not professional TV guys. Right. And 
I was shooting this thing. I used to tell all my friends that I play defense with Tom and Pete. They tell me what they want. I get the bare minimum quickly, and then anything I can build up from that, right. that's me playing defense, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was, uh, you know, it was crazy the first couple of years. I look back at those shows now, and I'm like, oh, my God, I'm ashamed. And what year? It was like 2000. Yeah. 2001, 2000. Yeah, yeah 2000. Yep. Yeah. And then as the show evolved and and... Tom and Pete got better at what they were doing and started to sell more. And, you know, it got to the point where I remember seeing Tom and Pete's face on Norton products at one point. I'm like, yep. holy shnikes, that's that's awesome. Right? When they rode that wave, like there, that was, I don't know if you want to explain, like late 90s, early 2000s car shows, they were non-existent compared to... No, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm not a super insider on the TV industry, mostly because I just don't care to be. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. But all I remember back then was, you know, Pete and Tom getting the show. At, well, even backing up the producer before them, we were on Speed Vision, yep. which at the time I thought was about as cool as things could get. Me and my roommate, my roommate was my editor. Mm -hmm. Um You know, I remember back in the day when Speed Vision started, you could turn it on and it'd be like, two boat shows at eight to nine like they'd rebuild the transom in this show and then this show would do a review about this new power cruiser and then then there'd be like british touring cars and then v8 australian supercars and then like last night's world rally championship from portugal and it's yeah. just like oh it was awesome and we were one of those that group of little shows that was in that sort of um you know half hour maybe not all resto but but it was that certain type of show not reality yet no right no not reality so, TV, yeah. And I remember I could have swore, maybe this is my memory playing tricks on me, but I could have swore I was walking somewhere with Pete and Tom. We were in Laguna Seca or, or I can't remember where we were. And I could have swore the one guy from Speedwalk, I was like, hey, Pete, Tom, how are you guys doing? Hey, good, how are you? Good, good. Hey, you guys want to do another series next year? How about 13? Yeah, boom, handshake, deal, done. And Pete's like, well, we're doing another series. What? <laughs> yeah you just saw the guy for 90 seconds we're doing another series like i just thought it was so cool and you know so we we're on speed vision all those years and fox took over and it was speed channel things changed a little bit you know i wasn't super jacked when the reality sort of stuff came in sure um i'm not a big fan of that but you know i i'm i'm old enough that i liked the dream car back in the day when we had the dream car segment the modern dream car or the vintage dream car segment modern dream car segment and i love the resto stuff yeah like when you guys did the you know, the 300 SL or even the GT40 a couple of years ago, right? That that ended up being a show. Mm -hmm. But in the early 2000s, there would be a three, three and a half, four minute segment every episode that was some element to the resto. And I thought that was cool. I thought that was super cool. But then when everything evolved and they started saying, oh, we, you know, we want you guys doing a two year GT40, thousands and thousands of hour resto, cut down to 28 minutes. Like, <laughs> come on. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. That's when I started losing my interest in TV a little bit. But it was, you know, it was a great ride, and we had a ton of fun and did some cool stuff. But it was, it was the the change in in the industry from just from my perspective, from like ninety eight to two thousand eighteen was crazy. Yeah, crazy different. Did that um, when you started to kind of when you guys were really hitting your stride with the Dream Car Garage show? How much did just that? real world kind of experience change your mentality like you're saying how you're you're going to talk to your friends in toronto and they're like yeah you can't do that like, well actually we are doing it <laughs> well i i got really lucky because you know i i when i left college i worked for that uh, sorry i was still in college when i started working for that small production company in st Catharines. did a lot of traveling on this outdoor travel show um then I, after college, couldn't make enough money doing that. So I went to Toronto. I worked like master control jobs. I got a job at TSN. So I was like, oh, cool, sports. This is right at my thing. It was all studio based. I'm like, nope, this doesn't work either. Yeah. And then I ended up out in Kitchener at a job. While that's happening, I'm meeting all these people at big places like Dome or smaller places like Hills. And I'm starting to shoot for them. And it was really fun. Um, so when the car thing started with the original producer, I really liked it. Mm -hmm. I hit it off with Tom and Pete, like all three of us have the same idiotic, childish sense of humor. Yeah. Um, and you could f even feel it then. So when Tom and Pete took over the show, you could see, I could feel like something was different. And the thing I really liked most about it was never mind the TV. The first two or three years of the series, I look at it now, I'm embarrassed. I would never show it to my students or anybody else. But there's this sort of thing that hung around legendary that was... Like I used to say to Pete all the time, your goddamn shop is full of misfits. Yeah. It's all like odd dudes. Yeah. That just have these crazy skills. But when you put them all in one place at one time, 
something cool happens Mm -hmm. and you could just feel that right so and the tv shows the same way like i remember we'd get off a plane somewhere it'd be pete and tom and me and the sound guy chris and they'd be like hey there's dream car garage where's the rest of your crew this is it yep (laughs) people are like well this show was here a year ago they had 19 guys we don't have 19 guys yeah right (laughs) so it's like it's just this weird and it's just you know it's just sort of a i suppose i got lucky falling into that group of people at the right time in the right place and and then it was 21 years of you know i think we did some pretty decent shows back in the day right and Um, do do you think it was like my dad's whole thing and i think you've probably adopted this to some degree was it has to make money. Yeah. Like it yep. has to make money. We can't just we can't just go out there and make art. No. Because we we won't last. No, and no, and that was the the struggle I had for a long ah, hang on a second, that's not the right term. That was the argument I had with myself for a long time. I know how much better we can make the show look if we wanted to, mm. but we just can't. Yeah. Never spend the money to do it. Didn't take me long to realize between the people, the environment um, you know, some of the cool trips, some of the people we got to meet, I'm willing to sacrifice. Well, it's not, I'm willing to sacrifice. It's his show, not mine. Yeah. But you tell me what you want. And I'll do my best to deliver it. Right. I know how much better the show could look if we wanted, but he's the boss, not me. Sure. Right. He's in charge of the dollars and cents. So I didn't care as long as I was having fun, regular work. And even, you know, like between Pete and a couple other clients I had where I'd say, guys, listen, I'm super busy. I can't be locked down to one outfit, but they would say, how much do you need per month to give us a minimum of X number of days? Sure. And I arrived at a great spot with all those people. And before you know it, all I need is three or four of these clients to get regular work. You know, yeah. and you sprinkle the domes and the hill, like all these things, motocross, racing, basketball, TFC, whatever. It was awesome. Like I was crazy busy, too busy at times. But it, it was never, I always understood, I guess, it from Pete's perspective, we got to make the best show possible with the amount of money we have. And I'm happy with that. Yeah. You yeah. know, I look at Top Gear and go, would I like to do something like that? Yeah. But that show at one time was also a million to an episode. Which is insane. Crazy. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think for what we did for 20 years, it was pretty cool. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, there's, you know, there's still a following out there. Yeah. There's people. Yeah. And that's the other thing, too. I think that, you know, I used to look at our show and think about, you know, shows like Top Gear, or some of the bigger shows of the U.S., and you just go, You know, we don't look like that, but I always felt that between the entertainment and personal sort of social skill that Tom had. Which, yeah. And the knowledge that Pete had, we were, we were pretty good for a few years there because those guys, you know, I remember shooting segments and, you know, I'm looking in the camera and Pete's saying something and in my head, I'm just going, oh, like real car guys are going to lose their mind over this. Right. Right. And it's like the language he uses and the knowledge he has and, and. And real cars, the guys are going to get turned on by that. When some of the reality shows are the throwing wrenches and all that stuff, I'm just like, get out of here. Like, come on. Yeah. You know, and Pete's also representing a real business. Right. That right. is, and that's what I tell people. That's what I tell my students. I produced this TV show for 21 years. Was it what I wanted it to be? No. But what was its job? Its job was to promote the core business. Right. And Legendary Motor Cars is a core business. So right. do that. Right? Yeah. Um, and like I said, like over the years, just crazy amounts of fun and, I remember, I remember Pete brought in like a marketing company or something from Toronto. We're going to, back in the day when at the end of a show, would say, you know, to order this episode of Dream Car Garage on DVD, blah, 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 right? Nobody buys DVDs anymore. But back then, so there's a meeting in the, uh, uh, at Legendary and the guy, you know, Pete's like, hey, that's the guy that does all the TV stuff. I don't know. I don't care. He does. It. And the guy goes, do you guys have an outtake reel? I go, I have a big outtake reel. <laughs> oh, yeah. And the guy's like, can we get a look at some? I was like. I don't know if you want to put this in people's living rooms. He's like, just cut me like two minutes. And then back then you weren't even sending them over email. You're sending up VHS or DVD tape, uh, sure. DVDs, right? So I shot the guy up a time code VHS tape. And then I saw them a few weeks later back here at Legendary. And the guy's like, we can't send that into people's homes. Like you just can't do it. Like the jokes were foul and the language was foul. But there were times on set where I was just like between me, the sound guy, Pete and Tom. Were we entertaining ourselves? Job done. Oh right? yeah, like, it was oh, ridiculous. Yeah. Like, we when 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 we were looking through all that old footage, I wanted to put together like a a montage reel of all of Tom's characters. <laughs> <laughs> like what? Were, so he had explain those Olio characters. Matore. What does that mean? Motor oil. Okay, Olio Matore. Yep. Yeah, and then he had the Scottish guy, but uh, but I but that's uh, I think From that's Bonifatuna Motors. <laughs> 
good luck. <laughs> but that was the thing. It's like the show felt like, and I, I would always, you know, I always, it would have been neat to be able to talk to viewers as a group because yeah. it always felt like their personalities are really what drove the show. People mm-hmm. love the car stuff. Sure. There's lots of car shows, but there's something about those two and the silliness of the sense of humor. And, you know, I remember the one episode when the set was up here upstairs at Legendary and we were doing a close and it just looked bland and it was, I think it was eight or nine at night. And we're sort of bored. And then you get into that silly space or you're laughing. You're just a bunch of morons. And so <laughs> I, uh, I think... Tom, probably Pete, left to take a phone call. By the time he comes back, I had like a this race helmet that I gave to Pete, and there's a chrome exhaust tip that I gave to Tom. And I said, you know, just wipe them down with a cloth or whatever. So I had Pete polishing his helmet, and Tom is shining his pipe. Yeah, right. It's like we we did the whole close like that. When the close ends, I'm like I burst into tears, and Tom's like, "What's up?" You're an asshole. <laughs> yeah, they, neither of them caught on. <laughs> Not right away, uh, no. That's great. But by the time they did, it was, and that's the kind of stuff like that. We just had so much fun, you yeah. know. If the four, if us four morons can entertain ourselves, we're pretty sure there's a bunch of other other gearhead guys, dummies yeah. out there. They're gonna laugh at it too, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's insane. Oh, yeah. So we were watching him, and, and oh, ta- he was the Canadian guy with the snowmobile. That's right. And then the Scottish guy, and I heard he had to, he had to have a little bit of liquid courage to help him out on the, yeah, on the Scottish was, uh, set. Yeah, that was uh, the better part of a bottle. <laughs> he had a bottle of scotch sitting there, and, you know. Because oh, I, was... I, I, I watched that one, and he's like, he, you can see his spit coming <laughs> into the camera, and he's just hammered. He's doing, what was it? The, what was he doing? The, the angry Scott or yeah. the mad Scott? Uh, yeah. I can't remember that character's name, but, yeah. you know, that, that was just, I remember walking, and he was telling me what he was going to do. I'm like, oh, my God, what are we doing here? But. You know, and then you know what's funny was I don't think it would have been long after he started doing all that kooky stuff. We were down at oh, we went down to Pebble the one year. And so we were in Monterey at the RM auction. We were there like the day before Pete and Pete's looking at cars, doing the whole thing that Legendary would be doing. And it was early. I think we got in early so he could go look at cars before the public was allowed in. You know, and it wasn't auction day, it was like I think the Wednesday or Thursday okay. even. And so Tom's like, boys, we didn't have any breakfast. I'm going to run and get something. I'll just get coffee and some croissant or whatever. So Tom comes back, and he says he's standing in line at some coffee shop, and some guy screams out from the other side of the room, hey, it's Olio Motori. And he's like, <laughs> that's kind of cool. That's cool, right? yeah. Like, we're not in this for the fame, or, you know, he may have been. But, he may have been, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. But people were, we were getting yeah. feedback from it, right? I, yeah. I just thought that was pretty funny and pretty cool. Oh, I mean, he was, he was so talented. I remember... Like, I have memories of just showing up to Mostport as a kid and and hearing, oh, it's Tom announcing yeah. a race. Yeah. And it's like, the race is red flagged for an hour. Tom didn't stop talking <laughs> for the whole hour. And people are tuned in to, like, the radio just yeah. listening to his, his spiel. Like, well, and what I used to say back then when I'd try to describe it to friends or even my editors who wouldn't be on the road with us, obviously, was, like, the most fun with those guys was... I don't know, what would that have been, like 2003, 4, 5, maybe up to 12 or so, um, or maybe even a little bit earlier than that. When it's like we'd go out on the road, and I used to say Tom and Pete were such a deadly pair because Tom is this big, loud, funny, obnoxious um, personality mm-hmm. who could just dominate a room, Yeah. right? And especially if he's telling some of his funnier stories. And you'd be in a room, and you see tom talking to people and commanding the room a little bit and then pete's sort of circling around the outside looking to buy and sell cars or do deals or <laughs> yeah. i'm like you know they, they were just like they were they're totally totally opposite but it worked for some reason yeah right and it was just it was just so much fun to be and of course tom caused his fair share of trouble too but <laughs> yeah even that i used to just shake my head and laugh and man yeah what a what a fun team that was right yeah so you got to tell because you were probably closer to it i've only ever heard it secondhand how the going down to DEI and the Earnhardt deal came about. How it actually happened? Yeah. Well, and just... I never saw it firsthand, okay. but if I recall, the way Tom explained it was um, he was doing some media thing because he was writing for the Star, I think, back then. Yeah. So he was at the GM plant in St. Catharines. Okay. Um, and that's when I believe Corvette was starting to get into ALMS. Yeah, with uh, Fellows, yep. Earnhardt, and Earnhardt Jr. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And so they were shooting something in the engine plant, uh, if I recall. Yeah. Yeah, for Corvette racing. Right. And I think, um, what's his name? 
is it Steve Crisp? Yeah. Yeah, who is, I believe, one of er- her Earnhardt's, Dale Earnhardt's right-hand guys. Yeah. He saw Tom. And okay. he's like, hey, you're that guy from that show. And Tom's like, yeah, blah, 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 blah. And he said, we should have you guys down to the shop. And I'm like, little dream car garage in Canada is going down to DEI? Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. What I didn't know, but I, I thought I remember hearing from Peter Tom later on, was that DEI was trying to soften Dale's image because he was about to leave NASCAR full-time and do a lot of ALMS Corvette stuff, Oh, right? Now, I don't know if that's true or not, sure. but I remember hearing that, and it kind of made sense because him and Junior were yep. in the yellow Corvettes all the time, right? Um, I don't know if he would have left NASCAR full-time because he was NASCAR, he was NASCAR yeah. right? Um, so, yeah, when we went down there and they invited us down, it was just, just this, you know, I, and I wasn't a huge NASCAR fan, but I remember growing up watching it, and there is nobody cooler than Dale Earnhardt, right? Right. So it's like when we got down there, it was just this amazing experience where, you know, like we're at DEI, it's this amazing facility, and Crisp was treating us like gold. And and when we finally got to meet Dale Earnhardt, it was this just, you don't often get to meet your heroes, right? Right. But that was one of the few instances where, you know, I've only been nervous meeting two people as a TV person, Dale Earnhardt and Bobby Orr. Yeah. Those are the only two I've been nervous about. And in both cases, as they say, you shouldn't ever meet your heroes. In um, both cases, I'm glad I met my heroes. Yeah, like they yeah, were yeah. just super, you know, as cool as could be. You know, Earnhardt had a meltdown on the shoot. The one day we were we were shoot, they had that big atrium in DEI, where you know you could stand in the uh, in the um, in the shop. Or, what, what's it called? Um, what like the you buy jackets and shirts? Oh, and all like that the stuff. merchandise so, shop. Yeah, like the yeah. merchandise yeah. shop. And there's this glass atrium, and you could look in and see a bunch of his cars or you know, sitting in there and the haulers in the back and, you know, it's just an amazing setup. And so there was a, I think a 56 Coral Chevy okay. that we shot a segment about. And so we got it all set up. We hadn't seen Mr. Earnhardt yet. And, you know, the hood was open and Tom's standing there. Pete's behind me. The lights are up. We're talking about what we're going to do. Um, I'm sorry. We hadn't got that far yet. Tom wasn't ready, but Earnhardt came up and said, yeah, we'll use that car. And he told one of his guys, wipe it down, make sure it looks perfect, open the hood. Make... And as Earnhardt opened the hood to make sure everything looked cool, somebody had left a, like a screwdriver, a, 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 a wrench or something on the battery, and he turned around and snapped. What's this goddamn thing? He threw it, and we're all just like, oh, shit, Earnhardt's scared. That's yeah. not good for us. But then five minutes later, we shoot the interview and like could not have been more polite and I was intimidated and nervous. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But then the thing gets going. It was it was really super cool. And then two things happened that I will never forget because I laughed so hard at both of them. Tom and Pete finished the segment. Mr. Earnhardt is so busy, I wasn't even going to cut the segment. We did it in one long shot. Right. Walk into a single shot of Mr. Earnhardt, back off to a shot of Tom and Pete. Walk into a single shot and so forth. And then we finished the thing. I stopped the camera. Tom walked off the set towards where the lights were, but he turned around and looked back and said something to Dale. I think Pete said something. And the two of them started this little conversation. And I was, and I'm like, this is awesome. So I hit record on my camera. I said, do you guys mind if I roll on this? And they're all, nope. Yeah. And so I shot a couple wides because I wasn't going to do anything that made it hard for the editor to use or hear. Mm. And, you know, Pete and Tom just engaged with, with Mr. Earnhardt about, you know, kids and why he had that car. He wanted it for his daughter and, you know, what, what, he felt like mechanical things can teach kids about getting ready for the world. You know, if you have a car, you should take care of that car. And here's yeah. why being mechanically knowledgeable. And I think, I think I only rolled for like 10, 11, 12 minutes. But then, you know, a couple of weeks after the wreck, I went back and watched it and I'm like, that was right. Like that was the Earnhardt you never see on the broadcast. Right. Right. And I just thought it was like, you know, you know, that was one of those moments where you don't get to see that if you're not there in person. Right, you know? right. Because he had such an image to uphold. Yeah. You know, on, on every time he was in front of the camera. Right, right. But but, but that's the thing. That, that persona he created was so big. He walked in the room and I get butterflies. I'm like, oh, jeez, here Keep your mouth shut. Don't do anything stupid. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah, you know, yeah. I imagine if you're walking down a hall with them and say something wrong, they'll put you in the wall while you're just walking, right? <laughs> yeah. But it was it was like this super cool thing. And then what we shot another segment with him. And what I thought was so cool was we finished a segment. I shut the camera down and I said, okay, you know, Tom looked, I believe he looked to the camera and threw to a commercial. He's like, we'll be right back right after this. Yep. And I stop. And then he turns to Earnhardt and goes, well, Earnhardt, now that we got you on tape, you can kiss my big fat ass. 
Oh my goodness. And Dale Earnhardt doesn't say a word. My he dad just, must have melted. Oh, I melted. I'm yeah. like, holy sh! He's gonna kill us. Yeah. <laughs> he turns on his heel. He starts walking away. Steve Crisp, his right hand man, takes off from where we were standing, and he runs up to Earnhardt. He didn't tell us till like two days later that. As he walked up to Dale, Dale leaned over to him. He said, you tell that fat son of a bitch. I think he's funny. <laughs> <laughs> so meanwhile, we're like, whoo, thank God. <laughs> but there's just like, that's one of those, he is one of those dudes where there's this glow. Yeah. You know, that you just, that was. That that was, was there was some cool segments. I was watching that. Uh, what was it? My dad got to drive Junior's cup car <laughs> around the property, yeah. and you made it out like he he had like kind of stolen it or took it yep. took it on a joyride and got pulled over and arrested. Oh, the two cops that showed up with their cruiser were fabulous. I mean, and again, that's what Pete and Tom and myself I think we're good at. What do we have to do that forty five minutes an hour? Really. But, you know, a real TV, no, not a real TV crew, but a big professional TV crew. Ah, oh, we need seven hours and 14 people. And we're like, we don't have that time. We just wouldn't get it done. No. Right. You, you DEI's can't. busy with this stuff. They got races coming up. So, hey, can we have that car and a couple of guys for like 45 minutes or an hour? Yeah, boom, done. Yep. You know, and then the cops showed up. We ripped that thing off in an hour. Yeah. Right? And again, do we sacrifice quality? Yep. But we still got something we wouldn't have had otherwise. Mm -hmm. Right. And I thought that was that was super fun. And, you know, Pete pulling away in the car, looking through the back window of the cruiser. Yeah. Talking about, you know, what this car is worth and how nice a paint is. Like, it was just, <laughs> it's just so silly. Yeah. But, you know, but the same thing with Junior. He was he was wonderful to us because we did a segment with him one night. Um, I think it was a blue Camaro we had. And he did some segment with Pete putting in a. They were doing like the weather strip, yeah, like a trunk, a, like a trunk seal. Yeah, right. It was it was like no big deal, but there's just I don't know. They just seem like those guys that transcend, despite the multi billion dollar world that is NASCAR. Yeah, they just seem to transcend all of that. There's some right. guys that are bigger and greater than the whole, and they seem like one of them. Yeah, you know. And no, even I, I listen to Junior's podcast I now. Do now it's too. like, yeah. man, that, that's good. Yeah, right. The history stuff. Oh. Is just so good. Just yeah, we were, you know has some guy on talking about shooting their way out of Pickens, you know, because the guys from South Carolina thought the guys from North Carolina were taking their money. You know? Yeah, and, it, and I mean it was it was just one of those deals, like I said, where you meet your hero, and if it's better than you expected, yeah, man, yeah that's yeah. that's well, and even too, I remember. Oh, you know what? It was the night we were doing the the trunk seal on Junior's car. They had that one building there called the. The deer, the deer head? head shop. Yeah, the deer head shop. Yeah. And there's just dozens and dozens of mounts in there. And at the time, I was also working on a hunting and fishing show. Right. right. So we were in, and I remember too, because a couple of nights before that, we were all sitting in the room and we were all nervous. Oh, we got Dale Earnhardt. We got Dale Earnhardt. I remember saying to Tom, like, listen, they need us here for something too. Like, we're nobody compared to them. But they need us here because I don't know if they're trying to soften Dale's image or, 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 maybe start to introduce the world to the fact that he's going to be driving in, in endurance racing. Right, because you guys shot a little bit of the Corvette. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Um, but I remember saying to, to Tom, like, hey, let's not sort of get bent over here. Like, we got to take a little bit from them. Like, mm. we got to do stuff that we want, right? Right. And, of course, Dale was totally awesome with his time. Junior was awesome with his time. So we were in the deer head shop shooting something. I want to say it was 8.30 or 9 o'clock at night because it was definitely dark out. My battery ran out. I put the camera down, walk out to the van to get another battery and i see this pickup truck hit a couple of gates checking the locks it's dale like checking the locks of his own shop i was like that's kind of cool yeah so i go inside fire the camera back up he must have checked the property and then he came back to the deer head shop and he come in and hey how you boys doing and and everything just stopped and like we're all just standing there talking but you know and i did Maybe this is a bit of a dick move, but I, I did it a little bit on purpose because he came in the shop. We all stand there talking and we were pretty much done the segment. So you know, we're just, of course, Tom and Pete and all the racing stories. Everybody's talking race car stuff. Yeah. And I, like, I was like, oh, that's all the dude talks about, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's like there's a little love in the conversation. I, I pointed at one head up on a wall. I, I thought it was a red stag from New Zealand. I think that's okay. what it was. And I say, hey, Mr. Earnhardt, what, what is that up there? And he walks over and he goes, what do you ask for? I go, I just wonder, is that a, is that a red stag or what, you know, whatever this New Zealand animal was. And he got this big smile. He goes, how do you know that? 
And I go, well, I work on a hunting show. And as soon as I said that, his eyes got big. Yeah. And he's like, no way. And he comes over, he starts telling me stories about, you know, hunting in Montana and the mountains in the Western U.S. And, you know, at one point he put his arm around me and just to be a dick, I turn, I look at Tom and I winked at him, eh? Yeah, yeah. He yeah, fires yeah. me the finger. Like, <laughs> I was like, hey, I'm just over here talking to my buddy, Dale Earnhardt. So <laughs> you, you can stay over there. Don't bother us. <laughs> right? like it was just... We're talking hunting. But that's the thing. Like, as soon as you mentioned, you know, a, a mountain hunting trip in yeah. Western you know, wherever they were, Montana, Wyoming, like he just, you could see his eyes light up and it's like, ah, oh, this, is, he's great at racing sure, and he's crazy for it, but this is his love. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was, I just thought that was super cool. Yeah. Cause he would have to talk about racing oh, ad nauseum just yeah. until his ears bled. Like. Yeah. And I imagine, obviously I don't know this, but I imagine he was probably never happier than on horseback riding through the mountains, maybe the bow. Going yeah. to set up somewhere for elk or... Or even just in North Carolina in one of those com- yeah. comfy-ass freaking deer stands oh. with the radio playing oh, or set, whatever. Setting out for turkey in April and yeah. dew and the sun's coming up. Like, oh. So that was just really neat. And I, and I was on a shoot several years later in, in Africa and I ran into to two guys that knew him. And one of them oh, had been from a, hunting. a co-pilot and had flown him several times personally around, eh? And he said, oh, yeah, the hunting thing for him was that was his complete escape and getaway. No media, no cars, no nothing, just outside yeah. in the mountains, you know? Like, yeah. that was, I thought that was... Yeah, I got to find that, uh, I got to find that footage of the the senior interview and almost just reach out to Junior and say, hey, do you want yeah. this or something? Well, I know, I know Pete and I talked about it briefly, because if I recall correctly... Uh, Mr. Earnhardt's wreck happened, and of it course... It was, like, like I guess to clarify, that was like the weekend after, or two weekends after... I think after it was two weeks after we you guys we, we were in the shop, yeah. yeah. So we were one of the last crews to be in that shop and get to interview him. Um, so yeah, the wreck happened, and then of course the public outpouring down there was... Yeah. Right? Like, And I've got friends who don't understand... Most of my friends don't understand. I don't have a ton of friends that are fans of motorsport. Sure. But I said, you got to imagine, this is the equivalent of like... If Sidney Crosby or Connor McDavid fell down on a breakaway and, you know, had a, a terminal crash yeah. into the boards. Like yeah. it's that big in yeah. the in the US world and racing culture, obviously especially. And then I remember Pete said that someone from DEI called and said, Oh, after what happened, can you please not use those segments? And I just had just about had a heart attack because we had a lot of stuff that we shot down there and for a little show like ours to have someone like that. And then I was like, oh, geez. And I th- if I recall, Pete said, you know, what do you think? I said, if they ask us not to do it, we don't do it. Yep. Like, they invite us down, yep. right? We don't have any right to to go against their wishes. And then uh, and then several weeks later, somebody called back up and said, hey, guys, you know, we've got a little bit of distance, a little bit of time here. And, mm. you know, if you want to go ahead and use it, um, right. go ahead. I don't know that we used all of it. Right. Um, there were one or two things that we left out, but... You know, I, I think in Pete's position, when, when Dale Earnhardt Incorporated asked you to do something, yeah, <laughs> yeah you yeah. do it. <laughs> yeah, no <laughs> doubt. No doubt. You had always had, uh, uh, from what I remember, but I don't remember any specifics, like pretty cool stories from your hunting and fishing show days. Oh, yeah. That was, that what was, was the, you had one big kerfuffle in Africa? Or is this, or maybe you were talking to a guide? Who had a big kerfuffle where there was like legitimately some people coming to I don't know hold them up or or rob them or something. Well, yeah, the 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 there's a fella up here who created a, a brand of crossbow okay. several years ago. Very successful, eight type personality, like just and and I worked with him through the hunting and fishing show I was on as he was a sponsor. Yeah, you know he's an Ontario based guy sponsoring an Ontario based show. And I always got along famously with the guy. Uh, I just thought he was he was an impressive dude. He built up this awesome company and had these amazing products. And so we were on a turkey hunt one year, and he said to me, you know, hey, later on this year I'm going to Africa. He was trying to complete his big five. And he says, I'm What's going. What's the big five? I think that's lion, leopard, cape buffalo. Uh, Holy cow, yeah. I can't remember. Elephant can't remember, Yeah, it might be elephant. I can't remember what yeah, they all yeah, were. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, he said, I'm doing this trip to Zambia. We're going to be gone for a month. Like, we're going to be out in the bush bush. Like, not what we call the bush, but, yeah. you know, land somewhere, drive an hour into camp. And I remember when we landed, I said to the guy, you know, hey, you know do you guys use the generators often? He goes, no, only when we have to. I said, oh, why is that? He goes, because when we go to get diesel, it's uh, it's a six and a half hour drive. You know, like, that's the closest gas station. Like, you go in a plane, there are no, you know, there's wow. no daily flights. Yeah. So... 
Um, so he asked me if I'd consider going and I was like, yeah, I'll think about that. And he said, you know, what would it cost me? And I gave him my day rate. Yeah. Of course he's like, no, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. So I cut it down by like 70% because I mean, what an experience, right? So I ended up going over with him and it was just this amazing experience. But while we were there, the guide, uh, the owner of that particular outfitter, he had been in that, um, either hunting or tourism world for years. And he talked about how in the seventies, sixties and seventies is, African countries are gaining their independence from their former colonial, mm. you know, um, master countries. Um, he said, like, things were going crazy. Like, like there would be civil wars and, and, you know, armies would go out into a field and just machine gun down herds of animals and, you know, field, you know, you know dress them, smoke them, butcher the meat. That's how they feed their armies. Right. And he said that even lasted, you know, when, when African sort of photo tourism became a big thing. He said it was even sort of then. So... You know, the trip I did with those guys, we had, you know, the, the owner of the company and the, the client for whom I was working were sitting in the front. I was sitting in the back with these five Zambian dudes and one guy from the government carrying an AK and a bunch of grenades and a bunch of magazines. And because there were still so many um, uh, poachers out there okay. that they have to be careful. And he was talking about how in the 60s and 70s and early 80s, he said the poaching was so bad there. It was not unheard of that there would be firefights between poachers and and other I guess Jeez. government, um, you know, the, the people trying to preserve the animals, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, like, he told us some stories that were pretty heavy. Like real <laughs> shoot, <laughs> real shootout type. Yeah, you know. Um, now, he said, for the most part, that sort of thing doesn't happen anymore, but there are still, there is still poaching as an issue. Right. Obviously, right? But, yeah, it was, you would sit around the fire at night, and the guy would tell you these stories, like, holy shnikes, that's, that's, that's heavy. That's Wild West shit. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, even what we did there was just, I never imagined, it spent a month in the, yeah. wilds of zambia and you know i remember the one night uh, the one morning i woke up and the guy said hey come here look at this and he, what's that I, go, I don't know what it is and it looked like somebody just dropped a pillow in the sand he was that's an elephant footprint and then you start to follow them and you're like that giant damn thing moved through camp and i didn't hear a thing he goes nope you wow. won't hear a uh, you won't hear a sound when they come through camp really? i was like wow that's, that's pretty cool yeah <laughs> you know Man. Yeah, it was that was a that was a great time. That was like a month that you'll just never forget. Right? Yeah. I'd like to go back and do it with a camera one day, but for sure. Well, even Dream Car went to South Africa, right? That was Oh, a, I forgot about yeah, that. Yeah, that was a that yeah. was a that was a really fun trip. And, you know, well, Pete and I, you know, I'm maybe using this word very loosely, but Pete and I were nearly attacked by a giraffe. Well, I think, right? yeah, what was the story <laughs> yeah. that it hit the, the the vehicle you guys were he in? He tried to, yeah. We were, uh, we had been out, you know, we'd shot a bunch of stuff for the show, and the the lovely young woman, who I may or may not have been in love with, who was our guide, <laughs> <laughs> she's this tall, very attractive, redheaded girl, and she was, I think she was taking, uh, she was preparing for a life to work in the African Tour, tourist, or. not even that. I think it was a more scientific, like population control oh, okay. of different animals, making sure endangered species get the sure. help they need. Like very, very bright young lady, but she's our guide, and she had a rifle on the dash of the of the jeep that we're driving around in. And I remember, you know, I'm sitting in the front. I jumped in the front seat with. I'm. I gotta have the camera, you guys. I'm sitting in the front. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm chatting her up the whole drive. And at one point, um, I said, "So you ever had to use that thing?" And she looks at me sideways and she goes, "Not on an animal." And I'm like what does that mean and she said i guess some multi-billion dollar telecom company in europe had sent their top i don't know a dozen or 15 salesmen and their wives down to yeah this this high-end uh game preserve so uh she said they had like five jeeps full of these tourists and you know a bunch of them were drinking the one day and they had the the group of jeeps had pulled up and there was like some lions laying under a tree or something there's definitely lions but they were laying in some situation in the heat of the day and some idiot jumps out of the Jeep, and he's yelling at his buddy, hey, take a picture of me with these lions. And she's like, hey, get back in the Jeep. And the guy's like, I sold a billion dollars worth of, I don't know, phones or internet equipment, <laughs> whatever. And she's like, I don't care. Get back in the Jeep. And the guy's like, no. And she grabbed her rifle and walked down and said, get in the goddamn Jeep. And the guy's like, no. So she butt-stroked him in the side of the head. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I was like, that is so badass. That's when you <laughs> fell in love. Oh, yeah, 100%. <laughs> but, you know. Uh, the next day, she introduced us to a guy that uh, had worked in the sort of the African game industry. He's seen people killed, right? That have jumped off jeeps and, yeah. you know, hey, I want to get a picture of this cool lion. A lion will cover that seventy meters in a couple of seconds, and then you're done. Yeah, you know, and he like he's he'd seen it back in the seventies and eighties, and he said these are the things that will kill an industry, right? Right. So, yeah, you can't have someone torn apart. Of yeah, 
but you know, Pete and Tom and myself and Chris went down there and we, you know, we shot like crazy at the, what was the name of that company? Superformance. Superformance. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that can't remember the actual name yeah. of the factory, but, mm. but yeah. And, and we shot a ton with them. The owner was fabulous to us, gave us full access. To the f- it was so weird. You're, you, where are we saying? Port Elizabeth. You know, you drive out to this huge automotive factory in the middle of nowhere. I want to say it was four or 500,000 square feet. And you see these dudes like polishing these dudes and ladies polishing these cars and like they look good. Yeah. And I can see Pete walking around going, what the hell? What's going on here? This guy's got a factory in the middle of the forest. Yeah. And the stuff that was coming out looked wonderful. The welders could weld and the painters could paint and the polishers could polish. Like it was really cool. Um, but then when we went on that, uh, he, the, the owner sent us to his buddy's game preserve. And so, you know, we all went out and looked at animals the one day. And then my sound guy and Tom, you know, they maybe tipped a few too many the one night. So they didn't get up at five o'clock the next morning to do another game tour. But Pete and I did. And we we're driving on the top of this hill. And then she goes, oh, look, giraffe. And you sort of moving back and forth. So she rolls the Jeep down the hill. And this, this giraffe had found a tree with a broken branch. And he, he was rubbing his belly on it. Okay. Right? Yeah. I really felt good for the... The big fella. And then he looked at us and he started backing towards us. And the girl driving the Jeep, she just pushed a clutch in and rolled us downhill 40 or 50 meters. The draft turned. He walked towards us, got within eight or 10 meters, and then turned around like sort of butt first and started to back into us. And she's like, nope, we're going. And she started the Jeep and took out. I'm like, I got my camera. I'm like, oh, come on. let's." And she goes, guys, when they back into you like that, he's about to swing his head and he'll contact the Jeep. And that's not good. Like that head doesn't look that big when it's way up there but when it comes down yeah. at you at 25 or 30 mile an hour and then that night when we got back to that afternoon we got back another jeep had been hit by Jeez. a giraffe head there's a big huge dent i'm like holy moly i didn't know giraffes would do that but yeah you know but yeah that was just one of those sort of funny little things that yeah never imagined no. right but that trip was amazing huh. that, that was like i remember i got i got we went down to whatever the health clinic and I got all my shots to go and then it got I, we couldn't go for oh. some, whatever reason I was like seven or eight years old or whatever like I just got a shot for whatever freaking <laughs> <laughs> yellow fever everything yeah. <laughs> and I'm just well protected in Ontario <laughs> but it, it was funny too because we ended up shooting a segment there the guys at um at Superformance they had uh obviously they had the Cobra yeah right and we had done a bunch of segments here so we went over there. I said, well, why don't we take one of their Cobras, drive it to the Shemwari Park mm. and shoot a segment there? Because now we're going to beat the hell out of this 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 uh, this um, this car on dirt roads in a game preserve in the dust in the African savanna. Yeah. Right. And so we ended up doing that segment. <laughs> I remember I'm sitting up in the Jeep and Tom and Peter in this yellow Cobra <laughs> and there's lions and elephants in the distance. I was like, you guys know what you look like from where I am? Big bowl of food. <laughs> they're both just flipping me the double bird like yeah. that's not funny there's lions nearby well, it's funny to me i'm up high yeah. so <laughs> but, but yeah just what an amazing experience for our you know our oh little, yeah our little tv show <laughs> no for sure you were doing i guess simultaneously you're doing the hunting and fishing and what was the deal you were working on a pretty big fishing show were you not what or, or two who are the guys who got popped for doing illegal stuff? Yeah, back in the day, Henry and Italo had a Canadian sport fishing. That thing was a monster. Okay. That was a big, big show. Um, I didn't work with them regularly, but I knew both of them. Okay. You know, I did okay. some shooting for Henry after the two of them started their own shows. And uh, you know, I did a couple of volunteer trips with Italo through you know this church thing that he does where we were okay. fundraising and stuff. But yeah, their show, that thing was a monster. That was a monster for many, many years. But the post house I worked at, we they, okay. the guys there shot and edited that show. Right. Yeah, that thing was a beast. I never, I, I wasn't extensively involved in that. Okay. But you know, and did who was it? Those guys who got in trouble? What was you told me the story yeah, once where they, they audited the whole stu- like editing house or something? And like, yeah, the, I just remember they got into some some trouble on a per- specific show, but because I wasn't involved in it, I didn't know the right. details. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I always got along with them okay, but you know, it was just one of those bummers where the two of them built this monster and then I don't know what happened between them, but they went their separate ways, right? right? So that happens a lot. Yeah. yeah. No oh, big yeah. deal. Yeah. But you know, I knew both of them and, and worked a little bit with both of them, but I wasn't extensively involved. Right. So. Um, you always mentioned when you were younger that you had done, did you do like a year of traveling? Or like uh, a couple just seven months. months. Yeah. Where'd you go? Uh, you know, it's just me and a buddy did that traditional backpack around Europe thing. Yeah, right. Um, 
I got really lucky, I think, though, because okay. we went over March of 90. Um, so we saw the poll tax riot in London, which wow. was, I think they had said that was the biggest riot London and England had seen since the Depression. It was <laughs> it was hairy, and it was scary, and yeah. we were right in it, and it was that was something. You know, we got to see a Canadian guy leading the Tour de France when Steve Bauer was leading a stage. Uh, World Cup was in Italy that summer, and we got to see Roger Waters do Pink Floyd the Wall in Berlin at the Berlin Wall eight months after the wall came down. No Yeah, way. like it was just this crazy summer where it's just everywhere we went, we got so lucky. It was ridiculous, right? But, you know, when you're 19, 20 years old, you're backpacking around Europe, you're, you know, getting to see the world for the first time. It's It's... You know, I mean, I'm a big advocate of travel. I tell my students all the time, last day of school, you got two summers left in your life. You've got to travel one of them. Right. Right. Because the first time you land somewhere and you're the different color, different language, different religion, different culture, now you're on your own. Yeah, It'll yeah, change yeah. the way you look at the world, right? Like my yeah. politics got shifted big time because of traveling and meeting people in different places. And right. I still want to go to some countries that friends of mine are like, what, are you mental? Mm, no, I just want to see it. Yeah. Right? Where do you want to go? Well, right now, the time, you know, obviously we're going to wait for COVID to be gone, gone, because North America seems like we're in pretty good shape. A lot of the rest of the world isn't. But, you know, number one on my list is Japan, obviously, a lot of people. Want to, but I really want to go to Iran. I've okay. talked to a couple of people that have been there, and they all say, like, you can't imagine the hospitality, mm. right? You just you just can't, because in the same way that most of us in the West, our governments are full of garbage. Yeah. Why should their government be any different? Just because their government says something doesn't mean their people believe it. And oh, everyone sure. I've ever talked to who's been to Iran says, and I, although in the Arab world in general, mm-hmm. hospitality is off the charts, mm. right? Like I, every, you know, I've been there a couple times, a few times, and it's like, man, they are. Oh yeah, it's a cultural thing to them. Yeah, right. And I just think that's that's super cool. And and you know, I know people nowadays. I would never do this. I'd never do that. I mean, I I would avoid China before I'd avoid Iran. No kidding. You know. Yeah. No kidding. So. Oh, we'll see one of these days. Yeah, I think if you're savvy enough to go to any of those, like to go to any of those yeah. places, you can yeah, like, figure your way out. Well, Iran's one of those places I don't think I would go to the first time alone either. I don't even know if you can go alone. Sure. But I would go on a one of the, one of the companies that does the guided tours. I wouldn't go there on my own for the first time for a couple of weeks, but I would absolutely go with them and then maybe book four or five days. And so when the tour is done, maybe you check out, you know, Esfahan or or Shiraz or, or Tehran on your own and just see if you can get by. Yep. There isn't a lot of English there apparently, Okay. but it, you know, I've been in a couple parts of the Middle East where there wasn't a lot of English and you can always get by. Yeah. Right. There's yeah. always a way to figure out how to do it, which would be, I think really interesting, but, but we'll see. I, I think, you know, given COVID situation, another year at a minimum. Sure. You know, did you travel, you were in the Middle East before we went on our, sh- with the show? Oh yeah. That was like, that was 20 years ago, a little bit more. I did like a two month just backpack around, uh, landed in Egypt because okay. I just basically want to see the pyramids. Yeah. Just there. And then, uh, went across the Sinai in a bus. And then it was, so it was Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, and Israel. Okay. Right. So it was just a backpack trip through that part of the world. Wow. And that, that one, that one shook me up. That, that was. In what sense? I'll go back even further. When we were kids and we were backpacking around Europe, the guy I was traveling with, his brother, uh, sorry, his uncle was a member of the Canadian Diplomatic Corps. Okay. So he was stationed in Morocco as like some kind of Canadian economic liaison. So he offered us to come stay at his place, which we did. Lovely guy. His wife was just a, a, a lovely lady too. They So they took us around a little bit. And then the first night, of course, they dropped us off at some toilet hotel mm-hmm. and they go stay in the five star down the road, <laughs> which is of course yeah. completely fair. But, you know, I grew up a news junkie. So all through the 80s, you know, when you had the PLO and you had the big shootings at the Athens airport and the Rome airport and planes getting blown up on the tarmac and I'm on, you know, I fell victim to what the media said. So I'm sitting in Morocco over my first night and I'm like, you know, and I don't want to sound mean here, but I'm like, these brown eye, dark hair, sort of darker skin looking dudes. Every time I see them on the news are blowing something up. Yep. And so for a couple of days, I was straight up nervous. Sure. Until I got out there and then like, you know, the hawkers are aggressive and the beggars are aggressive, but they're really, it's not what I expected, sure. right? Like the hospitality and, and you know, a lot of people say, oh, I hate going to those countries because you got to barter. But it's not just about bartering. It's about the relationship, yeah. right? It's You got to talk for 20 minutes to buy this damn t-shirt. Yeah. And that's, I think that's cool as hell, right? right. So that sh- trip sort of opened my eyes a little bit. So then, I don't know, eight or 10 years later, when I go to, to do the Middle East trip, 
it was that times 10. Right. Like Cairo is half the population of Canada in one city. It's loud. It's obnoxious, but it's got this energy. Like everybody's hustling and there's, you know, I remember in Lebanon, I took a picture of a, of a, of an F40 sitting beside a guy with a donkey and a cart full of watermelons. Wow. Right. On the same street. I'm like, that dude's hustled and made it. That dude's hustling. Yeah. And trying to make it right. Yeah. 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 And I don't know. There's I just, I've never had that. And I guess big picture when I started to question and go, well, is the media that full of garbage that mm. everything I've heard about Arabs in the Middle East is wrong? Maybe not all of it, but a bunch of it? I think so. Because yeah. I traveled in Syria for three weeks and felt pretty safe, and I thought the people were amazing. Yep. Um, Jordan was awesome, mm-hmm. right? It's just, uh, you know, you can't you can't judge a place till you go. No. And so no. that that whole two months was just, you know, I was a great experience then we went over yeah to the kuwait dubai thing right yeah you know dubai maybe a little less so but kuwait had that feeling kuwait had right? that feeling for <laughs> sure dubai is brand new yeah. the whole place yeah. is just brand new but yeah i don't know it's just like in kuwait know. there was still some buildings from the 90s that were like well they didn't rebuild that one. Oh yeah that's yeah. right you can see some of the damage right yeah but yeah i don't know man i just like those countries and i don't even it's not even like the countries that you should want to i think learn a little something sure you know so it was uh that that two month backpack trip was just awesome. You know? So you'd recommend your students to go somewhere that's a little bit uncomfortable, or do you just well, say I, travel? I, I think if you're eighteen, nineteen, twenty years old and you're in college, you got two summers left, and that's what I tell them. I said, you know, if you're a Canadian, American, Aussie, Kiwi, Brits, Western Europe, you know, the, in quotes, the Western world. Yep. You know, and I don't want to sound elitist, but if you're lucky enough to be born in one of those places, you maybe owe it to yourself to see sure what some of the other places look like. Yeah. Right. Because the thing that always struck me is having less or poverty doesn't necessarily mean unhappiness. Right. Like my thing in the Middle East was culturally they seem strong. Like mm. They don't put their old folks in a home. Yes. They add a floor onto the house and they put the young ones up there and the old ones get to live on the ground floor. Yeah. Right. And, you know, even like the community, like you, you, you go into a hookah shop and you're sitting there smoking a hookah and everybody's watching soccer and it's this cool... Um, you can just feel the culture between mm. them, right? And and I I don't know. It's just it's it's hard to explain. I just think you sort of owe it to yourself, yeah, to understand how lucky you got to be born in what's probably the most affluent time in history in the most affluent part of the world. Hundred percent. Right? Yeah. So, and you do see you do see culture because culture or Western culture these days is so discouraged. Yeah. If not if not frowned upon, uh, and and you. You know, then you you get these kind of secluded suburban lives where you don't have the grandparents living in the right. house or even visiting on Sundays. You see them, yep. whatever, once every couple months, and there's there's something to be said for culture, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Well, and even like, do you follow Douglas Murray at all? Yeah, yeah. yeah I just like I've been I'm watching through the new book. Yeah, I've been watching all the interviews in the new book. I'm waiting to buy he is it, a and it's like animal on that he's, tour. Eh? He's exactly right, though. Yeah, right. Like I, I get so sick of people putting down. You know, certain cultures or certain countries or certain systems because they don't like it. I'm sick of, and this is this is a left and right thing. The extreme left and the extreme right mm. have that nonsensical. You know, got to tear the whole thing down and replace it with what? Yeah, right. Like, I don't know. I just you know, recognize the people that built our cultures before us did a pretty good job. Perfect, no, right. not at all, but pretty good. Yeah. Well, yeah, and 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 to think that that you're like they're not responsible for your starting position, right? You know the saying, right? We're all, we we're all standing on the shoulders of giants. Yeah, you know it's that's that's the whole Jordan Peterson Sam Harris debate, where Peterson's saying, you know, we are we can't just observe the world and deduce morality. Yeah, and Sam Harris is I don't know what he thinks, <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> thinks you can. Yeah, yeah, but. Uh, what, what did they what did they call those guys a few years? Oh, the intellectual dark web. Yeah. 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 Every one of those guys is so much smarter than me, it's shocking. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I think all those guys have, and you don't even have to agree with it all, mm. but they all have things to say mm-hmm. that are worth listening, right? Yeah. Like, I, I love when, when Peterson gets on that thing about, you know, new ideas will offend. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. I mean, you know, who do you think the dudes were there sitting down writing the Magna Carta? going oh king's not going to be happy about this any of it exactly yeah. yeah right like so I, I don't know i just i i i try to not take where i am for granted but right you know yeah 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 
Yeah, and 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 just I think another lesson from that, or or at least you know traveling or whatever or reading, you you can start to kind of grow this space where you you can grow a little bit of humility to say, okay, everyone through all of history was wrong. Yeah, always. Yeah, we're probably in that position as well. <laughs> you know, almost like the Earth was flat at one point. Yep. Uh, yeah. You know, you didn't need your large intestine at one point, <laughs> not that long ago. Yeah, I, I don't know. It just, it just feels like we're on a bad course right now. You know, there's there's so much. If 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 society's breaking down into the only unit that matters is the individual, important. Yeah, but that's not it, right? Our cultures didn't come from right from pure selfishness, right? You know. Like I like I think about it all the time. You know, I've I've probably read a little bit more and learned a little bit more in the last little while about, you know, a lot of people in the U.S. will say their original slin was save, slavery. Ours is the way we dealt with the indigenous people. Sure. Right. But go back and think about it. Like, can you imagine landing on the shores of Quebec City or something and trying to get across Quebec in the winter oh. without some indigenous guys? With you're dead. Yeah. You're a dead man. Yeah. Right. Um. So I, I don't know. You try to read and learn and incorporate it into your worldview, but man, there's there's just so much going on. It's hard to sometimes even hard to have those conversations because some people's starting position is unmovable. Right. 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 And yeah, and 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 the amount of of prerequisite knowledge to even have some of the conversations is so is so uh, desperate. Yeah. Like, it's so so different that two people might not even be able to have a conversation without a whole ton of you know required reading that right. hasn't been done yeah that's a great point i think you're 100 percent right which is why you know i think in a lot of the western countries as we see the two opposite ends of the spectrum moving further apart i just want to go hey the further apart you dummies move you know the closer together you get right Oh yeah, because that's yeah. that's what makes me so crazy. Is, yeah, oh me is too. The vast majority of us are in the middle, two a little bit left or a little bit right or whatever. Right. right. But the further apart the, the the spectrum gets, the closer you guys are together. When you yeah. have these silly conversations, ah, uh, you know. I heard someone. One more thing on the topic, but I heard I heard someone describe the diagram, like you know how you, you like you were saying the left and the right. You're not actually getting further apart. You're getting closer. Yeah. And he's got, you know, whatever anarchy in the center. And then as you get further and further out to totalitarianism, it's like a circle. And it's all part of the same circle, kind yeah. of the left and the right. Yeah. yeah. I th and I think it is. Yeah. Right? Because um, your required reading thing is, is that's a great point. Because I just look at some, like I look at that trucker convoy in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the early days, I was like, yeah, I get it. That's cool. But then when they blocked the bridge in, mm. in Windsor, mm. you know, one of my best friends, he runs the HR department at Toyota in Cambridge and Woodstock. They're getting ready to start laying people off. Yeah. Couldn't get stuff, right? So it really is your argument that damaging the economy makes your point for you because right. you're just going to piss people off. But initially I was, I got what they were trying to say. Sure. And I agreed with it. Yeah. Um, you know, prime minister using the emergencies act, not cool. Yeah. But um, at least on the flip side, there's a mandatory review. That's not going to go his way. No, I don't think. I, I don't you think. Know? <laughs> like, so it's, it, I don't know. It's like the further apart the ends get, it's almost like the less I listen to them because most people I know are not at the ends. They're somewhere in the middle. And that's the thing. You know, yeah. like I'm, I personally, I'm sort of left when it comes to social stuff, but right when it comes to fiscal stuff. Sure. I think there's a lot right. of people that fall into I that. I do too. Camp. I think yeah. that's 80% of North America. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, most people are nice and live and let live socially. Yep. And, yep. Th you know, it's also live and let live to be on the right side of things fiscally. 100%. Yeah. 100%. But, yeah, I don't know. There's big questions. Big questions coming. Let's mm -hmm. hope they all get figured out and answered by sane people who are willing to talk to one another as opposed yeah. to not. Because yeah. once you declare the other side the enemy and you stop listening, when the talking stops, that's when the trouble starts. Mm -hmm. You know? So mm -hmm. we shall see. Do you have uh, do you have tenure? Uh, I don't know. I don't even know if we have that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, you know, we're we're just well. I, I almost just said we're a little college, but our you know we're I think we're about thirteen or fourteen thousand students now. So for a college, we're a reasonable size. Yeah. Um, 
I don't even know, to be honest. I just yeah. sort of go in, I do my job and, you know, try to figure out how to get some of these, how to get some of these people where we want them to be. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because that's, like I said earlier, that's the hardest part of the job is, is, is not all, you know, like in, in something like our course, you know, I want to be a director. Cool. Not everybody wants to be. Sure. Like there was a kid in our course a couple of years ago, quiet, but you know, he just asked you the right question. Hey, Dave, those lights over there, what are those called? They're called pallet, whatever the series number is. Hey, can I go online? Yeah, of course you can. Mm-hmm. But the kid is just like, doesn't want to be a director or producer or whatever. He is just nails. You give him a job and he nails it every mm-hmm. single time. But he's got this quiet, under the radar work ethic. If you would have asked me at the end of second year, who are your five best? He wouldn't have been on my list. Mm. But then when we come back in third year, I'm like, damn it, I forgot about that kid. He'd right. be at the top of the list because hmm. I think he's the guy that employers would most say, give me a guy with a good attitude and a strong work ethic. I'll teach him what I need him to know. That's what most employers are going to say, yep. right? Um, and that's the hard part for me. I still struggle with it. I'm three years in. I'm still almost three years in. I'm still struggling with it, like trying to relate to some of those kids that need a different a different motivation or a different understanding, right? Right. And not giving all the marks to the kids who do the sexy jobs, not even marks, extra collegiate activities to the kids that make the sexiest jobs look good, but also the kids who are just good grunts. Yeah. You know, because those are the guys every great production is built on. Some of the guys that do the ugliest, hardest work before the cameras and actors arrive. Yeah. Right. So that's the thing I'm still trying to nail down, but it's also fun. Yeah. Right. So. No, that's good. No. Crazy. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. yeah I, know, I like five years ago i didn't imagine myself being a teacher no no i was a tv guy yeah right but as the body takes a beating and all the rest of it and you know i just got lucky because it finished up you know the show finished up yeah two months before that job offer came in really like crazy lucky oh, i didn't realize you know? the time oh yeah total horseshoes yeah right and you know because pete said to me yeah i don't know if i'll continue with broadcast and i was like oh okay cool and so i figured there was something internet related that he'd do but i don't know i just felt like my time was coming to an end and i started cranking up some of my freelance contra- contacts again and yep. then when the college called him like who just retired yeah i'll apply for that so it's like again the universe just sort of for some reason knelt over and tapped me on the shoulder and goes hey dumbass you're getting lucky again yeah yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> well, that's good yeah it was yeah but no, thanks for coming on, man. Anytime, I man. I appreciate it. I you know the, me. Uh, I mean, I mean, I, I tell people all the time what, that this place is a little bit different, right? Yeah. It's not a big, I don't even know what the right words are. It's not a big business. It's one of the most solid groups of individuals I've ever seen. Is it a little bit different, a little bit odd? Yep. Sure. You yeah. know, not to mention, you know, it's funny. I used to, the question I used to get a lot on the road, because people wouldn't say it to Pete, they'd say it to me, he's like, are Pete and his boys really that close to each other? Like, mm. they never fight. I'm like, I've never seen them fight. Yeah. Right? Like, no. it's this crazy, you know, it's just this great social family environment that for some reason works despite some of the quirks of all the individual, single individual people involved. Yeah. Right? Super cool. Yeah. So. No, good. No, appreciate you coming on. I think, uh, man, I think the world needs more teachers like you. I, r- I really mean <laughs> well, it. Oh, maybe. <laughs> I hope so. People who are just willing to, you know, say it like it is. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know what? I think you're right. People do need to be a little bit more clear in the way they speak, but Mm -hmm. we shall see. Thanks. No problem, man. Anytime. All right. Take care. So that was Dave. Hope you guys enjoyed the episode. If you did, share it with a friend, subscribe, and give it a rating. It really helps. See you guys next week.